Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to have this conversation with my colleague and friend, Kathleen McDonough. She's a fellow PT in California that attended a session with one of our teachers with, that we love studying with, Dr. Mary Massery. She did a talk on COVID long haulers and not Pilates, but uh, for physical therapists. And Kathleen and I uh, were both signed up for it. However, I forgot about it. Kathleen sends me a text about 15 minutes into the presentation and was telling me how fantastic it was. She didn't know I was actually signed up for it and didn't, didn't log in. And so I was thrilled that she reminded me because once I logged in, I was so inspired, literally, and enthusiastic about the material we were learning. And we both thought, wow, this could be so great for Pilates teachers. So we had this conversation last weekend and said, you know, let's just have a conversation online. We'll throw some of the material on some slides, keep it really simple, and just let's talk about what we are inspired by from her work and, and what Pilates teachers can do for COVID long haulers, um, even prevention techniques and um, treatment techniques or, or interventions that they can do that would be great for people with COVID. So I wanna turn the floor over to Kathleen and I uh, wanna give a, a shout out to Mary Massery. She is the one that inspired this discussion and uh, she has some great information on her website, which is marymasserypt.com. And we have references to her material throughout our, our discussion here. Thank you, Sherry. And I would say that Sherry turned me on to Mary Massery at a combined sections meeting, a, PE, a PT meeting a couple of years ago and said, you can't miss her. She's a great lecturer and she is, and she does a lot of very functional movement and so much of it relates to what we do as Pilates teachers. So there you are and here we are. So what is a long hauler? It's someone who has lasting symptoms of three weeks or more after the first infection of COVID. And then what's the prevalence of this? Well, it depends on when you look and, and who's talking, but a minimum would be 10% of all cases and could be, Anthony Fauci just came out before uh, Mary's lecture last weekend, up to 30 cases, 30% 30 of all cases have long-term symptoms. So ongoing symptoms. So that is three to nine million people just in the US alone. So this is a huge problem. And it's certainly coming down the pike as people do recover, but still have lasting symptoms. And this is where we think that Pilates teachers can make a big difference. So what are some of the effects of COVID? The most common reported long-term effects include fear. So fear being the biggest one, fear and anxiety, because it's breathing. And if you can't breathe, you can't live. So fear being almost the most prevalent. Fatigue, shortness of breath, cough, joint pain, and chest pain. Some other symptoms include difficulty with thinking and concentration, <clears throat> also referred to as brain fog. And this is a huge issue. Uh, depression, because you have all these symptoms and you can't get your life back, despite the fact that people think that you should be able to. Muscle pain, headache, intermittent fever, and heart palpitations. Um, I think some of the other things about depression are it's not even recognized by the medical community as a thing. There were, it's, this is all new. It's a novel virus, right? And so people don't even know very much about it. Physicians don't know much about it. They don't know to refer. Um, so patients are left feeling like they're just kind of crazy and alone, unfortunately. So why is Pilates the perfect intervention for COVID-19 long haulers? When, when Sherry and I were watching this, I thought, oh my gosh, this is just all about Pilates uh, and there's so much we can do. COVID affects breathing most of all. And uh, breathing is really not optional, as Mary said. It's, it's not an option. You can't, okay, I can't run, so therefore I'll ride a bike. It's not optional. We do it or we die. And if we can't do it, it terrifies us. So there's that anxiety and that fear that's ongoing from not being able to get your breath. And certainly Joseph Pilates was right on target when he said, first, you must learn to breathe correctly. So increasing the breathing of capacity of these clients is huge. And then also some things that really struck us are that long haulers are often younger patients. They're often women who may be younger. 
They're often members of underserved or BIPOC communities who are either not getting good health care or not being taken seriously about their continuing and debilitating symptoms. So again, patients are feeling like my doctor doesn't know what to do with me. They're not taking me seriously. I look fine, but I am not back to normal. Yeah, I have a couple of uh, patients who are colleagues of mine, actually, um, that are uh, physical therapists that have tried to go back to work. Mm -hmm. And one of my colleagues uh, had it for five weeks and was near death. She did not go on a ventilator, but she was just at the borderline in her oxygen saturation levels that she was not hospitalized. They sent her back home and she said, I thought I was going to die. And she said for two weeks there, I, I could barely make it to the bathroom. My husband was helping me. And this woman had no comorbidities, no pre-existing conditions and was a healthy fit, not overweight, not diabetic, no hypertension. She is a completely healthy um, 60s year old person and uh, just nearly died from it. And she is still recovering after those five weeks of being almost in bed and she's trying to go back to work, but she's, she can't work a whole day. And uh, she's really having to pace herself to get back to work. And she's kind of on her own because no one knows what to do for her. Right. She's yeah. very smart, obviously. Yeah. And the, the case study that Mary Mastery used in her presentation was a 26 or 27 year old woman who was used to running seven to 10 miles a day. And she had symptoms 10 months later. And interestingly, on the call were two other young women who were both in their mid 20s, having essentially the same story. They said, oh, my gosh, I thought you were talking about me. So this is not just for people in nursing homes. Um, this is significant for a younger population as well. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what makes Pilates teachers perfectly situated to teach these people? First of all, we have all gotten to be pros at distance teaching. So uh, these clients may not have the stamina or the ability to get themselves to a treatment to, or to a studio. So to, uh, treating them, uh, uh, giving them lessons virtually is especially perfect for them, particularly when it might be short. So thinking about trying to organize your day for um, virtual teaching, if you've got somebody that's coming in, if you're back in person teaching, somebody who's coming in for a 30 minute lesson can really kind of throw a little bit of your schedule off, but doing telehealth, virtual lessons, 30 minutes, man, you could definitely make an impact and that may be just all they can do. So I think that we are, uh, are absolutely well suited to be working with this population. And then again, fear and anxiety are often the number one complaint. And Pilates really helps us to connect with our bodies, especially via the breath and to gain confidence and relax. So, and we have that elevation of spirit right after we do our Pilates. So uh, that definitely helps to counteract the fear and anxiety and for people to feel like they can get their body back. And then diaphragmatic breathing definitely focuses or facilitates, downregulates the parasympathetic system. And then I was just reading recently um, about the positive effects on the amygdala and reducing anxiety much better in, uh, in fact than medications. So um, what we do definitely has a physical effect for reducing anxiety. Yeah, and I was always uh, helping people understand that when they start their sessions, that they start with diaphragmatic, really slow, deep breathing, that that's going to facilitate that parasympathetic nervous system, calm them down, reduce the anxiety. Whereas if a person is depressed or, or feeling sluggish and uh, not necessarily working on pacing themselves, you might want to use a more invigorating breath, maybe like a Fletcher percussive breath in order to get somebody invigorated. So you can use your breath to sort of regulate the tone of a session depending on what the client is dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's just fantastic. We're, we're, we're seeing more and more research and, and medical professionals who are acknowledging the importance of breath. And it's like, about time, right? <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, I was just thinking, Sherry, and we're going to talk about this book, The Breath, uh, a little bit later on, but 
um, he talks about different breathing methods as being sort of like um, intermittent fasting with, with diet. Like if you can give your body different ways to be nourished, it's going to be more long living. It's going to be have a greater chance of surviving different situations. And they think that that's the same with the breath as well. So different strategies for breathing can complement different problems, but also give our body different resources for different times, which is really cool. Yeah, I love that. really cool. Yeah. Shortness of breath is a huge issue. And we want to be focusing on three-dimensional breathing because it's like strength training for the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. And this is what we do with each one of our clients every day. Uh, it's important to remember that the, the diaphragm is both a postural control muscle and a respiratory muscle. So the diaphragm function helps us to have a stable torso or a stable trunk as they called it in my day back in PT school literally last century. Um, so if we have a strong diaphragm, it's gonna help us with the muscular control of our trunk, which then helps us to transmit forces through our limbs, but it's also a respiratory muscle. So if it's impaired, we might have balance issues because of the lack of the, of the muscle, muscular control or fear of falling. So, and that's significant, especially with our, with our older population. Yeah, I remember when I did my first studies with Paul Hodges, when he came to the United States to teach, he talked about the diaphragm having to control respiration, be like a pump that, that regulates the high pressure and the low pressure system, which is what we call core control, right? And then it has to be continent to allow us to control our bowels and bladder. And then it also has to function with postural control. So Mary Massery and Paul Hodges actually studied together and did a few papers and, and experiments together. That's what Paul ca calls it. Um, Mary went over to Australia to study with him and do some experiments. And uh, so they are definitely speaking the same language when, when they talk about postural control, which I like that word so much better than core control, because I think core control has gotten misconstrued mm -hmm. in the industry. And it's like, use your core, tighten your core. It's like, no, that's not really how it works, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we want to try to share some great information that is the most uh, latest and up-to-date research on uh, postural control and use of the diaphragm. So as Pilates teachers, we talk about this all the time, right? We encourage our clients to take what, they, what they've learned in Pilates and help it make them enjoy the tasks of their daily living. So um, I don't know if Joe said it, I always think he did, but uh, it, Pilates doesn't make you better at doing Pilates. Pilates makes you better at life, right? Mm -hmm. So satisfying, satisfactorily performing our many varied tasks with spontaneous zest and pleasure. That's what it's all about, right? So helping them live a, a life with more quality and more fun and pleasure. Um, and then we can, we can ask them about just simple activities of daily living. Can they walk farther? Can they stay, take more steps? Can they slow, is their respiratory rate not um, quick and shallow, but how are they increasing the rest, uh, decreasing the number of respirations per minute to be in a more relaxed, steady state? Okay, take it away, Sherry. Hi, okay. I was gonna talk about assessments and what assessments can we use to get those great outcome measures that can be used for research also. But just making a, a small assessment, uh, a simple assessment, picking a couple of things to look at in your clients and then following those things to assess the effectiveness of your interventions and your exercise selections is a great way to motivate your client to um, understand how they're progressing and benefiting from Pilates and also can be used as a case study. Um, so of course, breathing observation, we're looking at several things, we're looking at what part of the rib cage is moving as they're breathing? Are they more of an upper lung or apical breather? Are they more of a costal breather? Are they more of a diaphragmatic breather? Their posture will often dictate that. And then how many breaths are they taking per minute? That's their respiratory rate. And when somebody is breathing quickly, they're usually breathing more shallowly. You want to be able to take in more oxygen per breath. So you want a deep, slow breath that is not too labored. And then number of syllables spoken per breath. 
And I know Kathleen's going to make fun of me about that because I can get in a lot of syllables per breath, <laughs> usually. Um, quality of life assessment tool. There's so many online to choose from. I've used the SF36 quite a bit, but there's a lot of others out there and you can just Google quality of life assessment or quality of life outcome measure and you can choose one that seems to be in line with what you wanna know from your clients. The timed up and go test is just the most basic, fantastic test, simple to do, anyone can do it. You just need a stopwatch or a phone that has a timer on it and a chair. So you just measure 10 feet, you have a client sit in a chair, measure, and I usually just put like a, a water bottle 10 feet away from them, and you start the timer, you tell them to stand up, hopefully without using their hands to push off, walk 10 feet as fast and safely as they comfortably can, turn around and come back. So they circle the water bottle and then come back, and then they sit all the way back down. So from sit down to walk to return to sit, it should take less than 15 seconds for someone to walk that distance. If it takes more than 15 seconds, those people are more at risk for, for, for falls. And they're also um, a, have a very slow gait speed. So that would be something to work on and something to strive for to get under 10 seconds. That's a really good goal for most, most clients is to see if you can get them under 10 seconds to help speed up their gait. There's a lot of literature out there that talks about gait speed being the sixth vital sign. And also that gait speed is a predictor for overall wellness and well-being, um, longevity and morbidities <laughs> so are related to slow gait speed. So there's, um, that's a really simple test that anyone can do. Also a visual analog scale for pain, which is um, just, you. Th there's the smiley face ones, there's the color one, there's the, the bar that you can mark on the line from one to 10, how, how high your pain level is. That's a very easy thing to do. You can do it before the session, you can do it before and after the session. And you can also uh, use it as a barometer for pain. I don't really like to focus on pain during a session. So I don't recommend that people, um, that you ask them, how's your pain, how's your pain, you know, the whole time. But if you can just let them know, let me know if your pain increases during the session, but then let them tell you if the, if the pain is increasing. So I usually um, let them kind of direct that and not focus in on the pain. Um, there's a lot of new research on, on pain and how to discuss that with your, your clients. That's for a different, <laughs> a different time. Um, rating of perceived exertion is something that is very important that we don't talk about a lot with the Pilates teachers. And this helps us with pacing our clients. If we uh, tend to um, give an exercise to a client, we want to know how hard does that feel? And the way we're going to do that is to give them a number of reps. So say we have 15 reps of footwork on the reformer. And I'm going to say, okay, Miss Mary, how, how hard does that feel to you on a scale of one to 10? And um, there's new, there's a modified Borg scale. There's a lot of different scales out there now, but I like the modified Borg, the one to 10 scale. I think the one to 20 is a little confusing for people, but the one to 10 scale is a really good one. And I'll say, oh, I think it's about a seven. And that equates to about a 70% intensity of the exercise, which is going to help us stay in the strength training zone. A 40 to 60% of intensity means that we are at more of an endurance zone and that the, the client can definitely do more repetitions. So maybe 15 to 20 repetitions of something. They can do no more than eight of something. It's too hard maybe for them. It might be too heavy. And we're using that one repetition max scale plus this rating of perceived exertion. Um, there's also something new I wanted to share with people that's called the repetitions in reserve. And so again, I'm doing those 15 reps of footwork or, or 10 or whatever you've chosen. And you ask, you know, how hard does that feel? How many more could you have done? So if the person could do 20 more, 10 more, it's too easy to build strength and you wanna increase the intensity, add another spring or two, right? And, or maybe do a single leg with, with more spring. Um, but how do you adapt the equipment to make sure that you're in that strength training zone? Because I think a lot of times people are in more of an endurance training zone and, um, and they might not be really challenging strength as much as they think they are, especially with the lower extremities. The core usually gets a good workout, the arms get a good workout, but a lot of times your legs are a little bit lacking in, in the strength training component in Pilates. Um, 
but this is all, also used for that post-COVID client that um, is trying to pace themselves. So if you're getting them at an eight, nine, 10 rating of perceived exertion, it might be too challenging for them and you might have to tone it down some. And it can kind of give you a barometer for, for how hard you're working your, your client and um, knowing if you need to increase or decrease the intensity. Some of the, um, thank you, Sherry, that's great information. And some of the people that were speaking um, at this workshop uh, who were COVID long haulers were talking about if they did too much, if they pushed it even a little bit much, they really were, they were you know, in bed for a couple of days or they couldn't go to work the next day. So um, uh, it was not just that they overdid it and got a little sore, they overdid it and they were debilitated, right? Yes, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that is, um, that's exactly what we're talking about with pacing because they're just so exhausted that they can't get out of bed the next day. Yeah, absolutely. So it's important to pace them much like you would with a multiple sclerosis client. Um, yeah, or I think about like when I was working in a hospital setting and people were post-op, they did not do well with two 30 minute sessions a day. They, some of them did well with, if you stop by and say, stand up at the bedside and then they lie back down, small snippets mm -hmm. of exercise many times during the day. And this may be something that will be useful for you for their home program, for their home practice, is mm -hmm. that they do little snippets of work because mm -hmm. some of them might just be able to do five minutes. So um, little bits repeated through the day or tied into activities of daily living may be where you go with their, their home uh, practice. Yeah, I, used to, I think someone called that exercise snacks. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, instead of a big meal. Right, exactly. And I'm always really tired after a big meal. I'd much rather snack. I'm a grazer. <laughs> okay, so some other recommended assessments would be to look at their acti activities of daily living with and without shortness of breath, like asking them, could you climb your stairs today without shortness of breath? And how hard did that feel to you? So you can use that rating of perceived exertion and ask them how they did with their stair climbing. You just pick one or two arbitrary activities and follow them along the course of their uh, time with you. Cardiovascular status is going to be very important pre-COVID status. So like the long distance runner that Kathleen was talking about, that uh, could not even walk a mile after she uh, had COVID and was supposedly well from it and healed from it. Um, you want uh, that new norm to be reestablished. And then with the Pilates exercise, how are you doing getting back to that normal level? Cause she may not ever get back to the point where she's running marathons or triathlons. We don't know what the potential is and how she will respond and how she'll you know, get back to doing her pre-COVID status. So um, the jury's still out on that um, until we see more long-term effects of this virus since it's so new. Um, I always like to include the client's goals for specific activities. And that's kind of what we've been talking about, but pick something that the client really wants to be able to do, running, gardening, what it is that they enjoy. If it's dance classes, you know, maybe they're, you know, take a dance class with their husband, um, you know, whatever it is that they're doing that um, they want to get back to. So I usually like to use that as a goal, you know, whether it's tennis or a sport. With observation, we want to look at the shape of the sternum. That's that's actually really important. It's and it and it's really is the sternum vertical? Does it stick out? We call that extroverted sternum, or does it is it introverted sternum, or does it go inward? And that we also call that pectus excavatum, which is a, an, an embedded sternum. And what happens a lot of times with the, an embedded sternum like that is that you don't have very much distance between the heart or for the heart between the sternum and the back and the heart's getting compressed in there and it's really hard for them to breathe. So I often think of somebody with that, that kind of sternum shape, I might put my hands on the front and back and get them to do uh, the um, bucket, not bucket handle, but pump handle breathing, which is more of the upper breathing, getting the, the uh, breastbone to rise with each breath. And so you, you um, might wanna look at that to see if that's something that your client might need. Um, the shape of the rib cage also, whether they have rib flare is something to look at with the rib cage posturing a scoliosis too. Same thing with that. You know, you might see a concavity on one side and um, convexity on the other. And you can use these breathing techniques by placing your hands in the concavity and asking them to breathe into it. So there's a lot going on with that with people that are working with scoliosis. 
then the occiput to wall distance test is my, one of my favorite postural tests. And that's just trying to get your head to the wall to touch the wall with your eyes level. And you measure the distance between the, the back of the head and the wall. And it's a super easy test to do on a regular basis, trying to improve your client's posture, which mostly has to do with upper thoracic mobility. And then the rib to pelvis distance is putting those fingers vertically in between the 10th rib and your iliac crest to see how many fingers you can get in there. Two to four would be normal. And of course, you're trying to increase more. Um, the most I've ever seen is five in a, a patient or client that I've seen and Pilates teachers that have gone through my teacher training programs. Um, and then the least I've seen is a zero with the rib cage is sitting in the pelvis. So that's something to, um, that's really easy to look at. And usually pre Pilates class to post Pilates class, you'll increase by one finger. So I always love to use that as a little outcome measure pre and post uh, one class, not, not just uh, long-term, but how are you doing today? Did you come into the studio today in your three finger distance or did you come in today in two fingers, right? Um, and so that's an easy thing to, to look at. Again, sure. yeah, go ahead, Kathleen. Sorry, yeah. On, on occiput to wall, just because I've seen this before, they have to put their tailbone and some of their mid back on the wall. Because oh, yeah. well. <laughs> I've seen yeah, all the same way. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, they, they will cheat to try to get there. So. <laughs> um, yeah, and then syllables per breath, uh, circumferential, inhale, neutral to exhale. And that's, that's the tape measure around the, um, the xiphoid process. You can do it around the axilla. There's you know different places that you could measure and uh, see how they do with inhale versus exhale. You should have two inches of inhale and two inches exhale for a total of four inches. So it's like if you're a 28 on the exhale, 28 inches, you should be a 32 on the inhale and you want it to be equal. So sometimes people are like three inches exhale, two inches or one inch inhale. And, and it's a little bit skewed. So you want it to be equal inhale versus exhale. And the neutral is right there in the middle or inhale would be 32 and the neutral would be 30 and then exhale would be 28. <laughs> so that, that would be the ideal. Um, and so you're just looking for that. And, and it, it tells you what you need to work on, whether you need to work on inhalation or exhalation with your client. So sometimes I, I will have people that are not very good inhalers to inhale for four counts exhale for two. And then if they're not a good exhaler, I'll do the opposite. Um, so just trying to bias the exercise to what they need to improve on. And that's just a fun way to do it. Um, the other thing is when you're um, cueing breath, I think we're going to talk about that in the teaching part, but um, cueing breath, we're, we'll, I'll save that till the teaching part. Uh, the breathing style it, again, looking at that apical, costal versus diaphragmatic and which one they're really good at or dominant at and uh, seeing if you can uh, get them to control all those types of breath. So using the right breath for the right activity is what we want. All right, so I'll turn it over to Kathleen for some teaching components. Okie dokie. Thank you, Sherry. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so some teaching ideas. Um, we we want them to breathe <laughs> clearly. <laughs> and ideally, if they could breathe in through the nose and out through the nose, that's going to be more of a diaphragmatic training method. But if they need to breathe out through the mouth or even breathe in partially through the mouth, if necessary, allow them to do that. Mostly, we want them to exercise their breathing. Um, but again, if, if they can breathe in and out through the nose, that may be of more use to them. And then um, interestingly, and we know this as Pilates teachers and we can use it and, and mold how we teach to, make, to take advantage of this. So um, physiology and posture are linked, right? We're gonna, when we inhale, we're going to extend our spine and we can use shoulder flexion and external rotation to facilitate the inhalation. So, uh, and with straight elbows to take us all the way up. Right. So if you can inhale with a full breath and then exhale with a full breath with arms down and a bit of spinal flexion, that's going to be simpatico with how we naturally breathe. However, and Sherry, would you share? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, however, the opposite actually occurs in a lot of Pilates training, and which is quite viable. It's if we're trying to make breathing easier. We want to have the person bring their arms over their head 
and have them inhale as they lift and go into extension, opening up the chest. This actually decreases the pressure in the, the thoracic cavity. We can use that to help them breathe better. In the hospital, a lot of times uh, we'll position people that are trying to breathe with the arms over the head. So that's what some of the therapists are doing in the hospital settings. We're trying to get people to have an easier time with breathing and maybe get them off the ventilator so that they're not dependent on the ventilator for breathing. And so if we're trying to make breathing easier, we want to bring the arms over the head. However, if we're trying to facilitate trunk control, which is often what we're kind of focused on in Pilates, we don't have to be focused on that, but that is something that we're focused on in Pilates. We would exhale as we lift the arms up. If somebody was hyperextending through the lumbar spine or having poor uh, control of the ribs flaring when they extend and they're having back pain, we might have them exhale to lift the arms up to engage the abdominals and support the trunk and facilitate the anterior abdominal wall to give them that better trunk control and decrease the pressure on the low back. So it just depends on what we are trying to do with the client and what our outcome is and what they're having trouble with. So we can use breath to facilitate the activity that we want, or we can use breath to challenge them, right? So we turn around and ask that same client to raise their arms up as they exhale once they start getting better and breathing more easily. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. All right, then we're gonna cue the diaphragm here. And um, so one of the ways to cue the diaphragm is something I think most Pilates teachers know is to touch the area where the diaphragm attaches right under those lowest ribs. It goes up under there in a dome shape. We're obviously not gonna to touch up in there, but we're gonna to touch around the area where the diaphragm attaches. And we're gonna ask for that inhalation and then have the, the client expand out into our hands. We can do front to back or side to side. But what I have found is really great, especially for the virtual client that you can't touch, is to use a yoga strap or the, the belly strap from the trapeze table and put it around their rib cage and put it pretty tight and then have them inhale and expand into it. It gives you that three-dimensional cue. Um, yes, just yesterday, I was working with a 16-year-old boy that has a history of asthma and some problems with breathing. And he has some pain in his, his chest wall and his uh, back. And um, I gave him the tape measure. We measured, I cued him, I laid him on the side. We did all kinds of wonderful cues for breathing. And then as soon as I got the strap out, he doubled his scores. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is your cue. Um, and the other thing I think Kathleen was saying was that she uses a TheraBand um, uh, to, to do any cueing uh, with it too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people do well with that, right? Yeah, and you can even have them just wrap the TheraBand around their lower rib cage and hold one end in the opposite hand mm -hmm. so that they can increase the resistance and decrease the resistance as they need to and feel that dynamic thing happening in the rib cage. Mm, great, yeah. Um, then with, there's also some a few devices that use breath restriction to strengthen the diaphragm or expiratory muscles. The first one that you're probably going to be familiar with, if you've ever had surgery, there is always an inspirometer um, on the uh, bedside table after you get back to your room, right? And you're expected to inhale to raise the ball up in the inspirometer. It doesn't have any resistance to it. Um, but the breathizer has um, a little pinwheel and it only resists expiration because you're trying to turn that little pinwheel. So it provides a little bit of resistance, but not too much, but you're trying to, to blow that pinwheel. I think Kathleen's doing it now. And um, then the breather training tool is this really inexpensive. It's like $40 on Amazon. I just ordered one last week. Um, and it's uh, just, just look up the breather on Amazon. You'll be able to find it. And um, it has a dial on the side that you can actually, and Kathleen's showing it there, that you can actually grade the amount of resistance from one to six. And uh, so you can start with a low level of resistance and you can also switch it to uh, resist inhalation or exhalation, which I love that. And um, then you're really training either the expiratory muscles, the intercostal muscles, the obliques maybe, and the pelvic floor to exhale. And then if you're doing the inhalation uh, resistance training, then you're, you're strengthening the diaphragm, right? Because the diaphragm relaxes on an exhalation. 
Yeah, cool. How'd you do? <laughs> we need to have a breathizer contest, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the the beauty of the breathizer is that we could pair it with that function that we just talked about. So doing the exercise, the wall, where you are holding the breathizer and rolling down into spinal flexion with exhalation, then pairs that postural. Uh, task with the breath, which we knew from Pilates, right? Which when we were listening to Mary, I was like, oh my God, it's a breathizer, right? Yeah, exactly what we've been, what we meant, we're meant to be doing and not a lot of us are doing it, right? <laughs> Joe really was way ahead of his time. So thank yeah. you, Joe Pilates. All right. So he'd be thrilled to know that we are still using his methods and they are now avant-garde. <laughs> yeah. And people are discovering the science behind it almost a hundred years later. So you know, if you, if you look at, you know, breath training tools, apparently this is a hot thing in, um, in athletics and in athletic performance to uh, increase your performance um, by training your breath and ha people having huge increases in their performance by training their breath. I mean, Joe, Joe knew that. He worked with athletes, right? And um, it's old news to us, but it's kind of taking it in and reapplying it to a different group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Larry Kalin uh, does is a is a cardiopulmonary physical therapist and uh, does lots of testing on inspiratory control. And he did this this big study with Harvard rowing athletes and saw great gains when they increased their respiratory control. So test of incremental respiratory endurance or tire testing is what he calls it. And you're basically trying to suck air in through a resistance uh, as long and as hard as you can. So it tests the strength and the endurance of the diaphragm. And boy, your diaphragm burns. And when you do these tests with resistance, you can feel the fibers inside your rib cage. I could feel them actually burning inside, just like I would if I was doing a squat, you know, with my quads burning. It was amazing. I was like, wow, there's the diaphragm. I know exactly where it is. So if and you really challenge it, you can see it. Yeah, and it's a muscle. Yeah, I can definitely feel that burning muscle, uh, which was so cool. I mean, it just really, it was a, a a huge awakening for me to learn this work from Dr. Kalen and Dr. Massery. It changed my practice a lot and made me focus even more on breathing. And then studying with Ron Fletcher and, and his work on breathing too, that was just such a great time period in my studies as a Pilates teacher. Um, okay, so we were gonna talk about the ha sound with glottal control and pelvic control and bowel elimination. Um, we sometimes forget that we have an epiglottis here that is part of our trunk control system and part of our pressure management system. So you think about the, the glottis here and the vocal cords and the diaphragm and the pelvic floor as being those pressure management valves. And when those are closed, right, we have good good control, like you're trying to open a heavy stuck door, what do you do, Ugh, right? Or you're trying to push something open and you and you grunt and it actually helps you. Have you ever seen tennis players like Serena Williams? She's a noisy <laughs> tennis player, right? <laughs> you know, Bruce Lee, ha! <laughs> and, um, and so they get a lot of extra power out of that control of the glottis. And it's something that we uh, have talked about a little bit in Pilates and what, what Kathleen and I were discussing was like the ha sound is uh, that Pilates teachers can override this control system, I think. So correct me if I'm wrong, Kathleen, but you know, like when we do the mirror fogging breath, it's like, <sighs> we're trying to get the abdominals to fire and the pelvic floor to kind of kick in. And um, Mary would say that that ha sound actually is really hard to generate a control of the, the trunk and the pelvic floor. Um, but I think the Pilates teacher has been able to use that to uh, go to full exhalation mm -hmm. and then get that contraction to happen because it's really the end of the exhalation. And maybe if they made a sound with it so that they're doing like a <sighs> like that, they, they might get a little more contraction with that. And you can sit there and try that yourself. Like, how are you gonna do a bowel movement with a ha sound? Like try that, be constipated and then open your glottis and go ha ah, and try to push something out of there. It's not gonna happen. 
<laughs> I know my friends are all going to laugh at me because I'm always talking about bowel movements and squatting. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's important, right? It's like, I've had people say, my aunt actually said I changed her life because I told her to sit up straight when she had a bowel movement and put her knees up and get like the squatty potty, you know, posture. And she was like, I've, I always thought I had constipation because I have like, ear, I'm eating the wrong foods. She said, I never felt so good in my whole life. You know, I'm having great bowel movements because I'm sitting up straight and using the right pressure management in my body. So <laughs> it was really great. So I love it when I can help people have better bowel movements because man, it does, it feels great. <laughs> and I think that really, you know, we can talk about that strong ha, like the Bruce Lee ha as almost mm -hmm. like a Valsalva mm -hmm. versus the foggy breath, like oh, fog up the window as tensioning your transverse abdominis, your pelvic floor, and your multifidi, right? Which is what we do more Pilates wise or um, in training our clients with, um, with back pain for PTs, right? So mm -hmm. kind of two different things, one for more power and elimination, I think, and one for more turn on any one of those three lamps on the same light switch to get the core control. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And like when you close your glottis to <clears throat> brace, it, it's like you push out into uh, your trunk to activate those muscles. So it increases pressure quite a bit more than mm -hmm. what we're asking with the ha breath, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's always these conversations that I love to have with my colleagues to see what is their take on it. And I wanted to pick Kathleen's brain about that. Um, and then Mary talks about uh, using the straight arm to activate glottal control as well and uh, pushing down with a straight arm, just like we do on like the pedipole or the supine uh, arm arcs on the reformer when we're doing straight arm work. Uh, the hundred, you know, on the reformer, it's gonna be having that resistance with straight arms. And uh, just, just while you're sitting there now, try straightening your arms out, putting them on the desk and then push down and see where you feel that. Do you feel something here? Do you feel something in your chest? right? Your arms, your abdominals, your pelvic floor, what do you feel? And now move closer to the desk and push down with your arms bent and see what kind of trunk reactions you have. I don't feel a whole lot in my trunk. I feel a little bit maybe, but, but not nearly as much as that straight arm press. So that's something that she um, suggested to us to get a little bit more control of a person that's having trouble with breathing. And of course the pedipole is one of my favorites and uh, certainly like that straight arm pull. And um, since last week, everybody's been getting the straight arm pull on the pedal, which they got it a lot anyway, but it wasn't much of a stretch. It's so important, right? And you see our, I mean, how many, how many times a day do you say, you know, straighten your elbows? And, um, and especially in doing inversions, you know, in doing short spines, like turn your straight arms on. <laughs> And do a bridge so that you can do it so you can make it more whole body. And uh -huh. if you've got these sort of um, checked out elbows, it's not going to help you generate force. It's not going to help you force transfer from a stable trunk to a powerful uh -huh. limb, right? And I think of the, the breathing exercise on the trapeze table with that too, the straight yeah. arm pull down mm -hmm. with the elevation of the, the hips. That is such a fantastic exercise. And I've always wondered why it was called breathing. Yeah. Like, what? And, yeah. and now I know, you know, Mary Mastery helped me understand that um, yeah. because that is the ultimate postural control. You're using the glutes, the lats, and the pull down to it's activate greatest. that whole system. Yeah, it's just the greatest postural control exercise. And it, it's often the way I get rid of disc pain in my patients that have back pain with disc related yeah. pathologies. They start acting up in the session. It's like, oh, that disc pain's kind of coming my legs, getting a little numb. Put them on the trapeze table, do the breathing exercise, give them a little extra pull, <laughs> and then boop, gone. And now they can finish their session, right? Yep. And really, that straight arm, you know, I talk about your upper limb core starting with serratus anterior, right? So if you can, or I call them your long line bra because I'm old and, you know, it's like Jane Russell and her 18 hour bra <laughs> and have the long line stays on the side. If you can, if you can gear into those, your serratus or your, I also call them your Michael Phelps muscles because you oh, see yeah. them, you know, swimmers. It interdigitates just like this with external oblique, which then continues in the same direction as uh, internal oblique, right? And so here's your sling. So getting control of that. And where do those two, where does your upper limb core meet your lower limb core? Right at the diaphragm. 
right? Yeah. Love right that. there. This is where yeah. the rubber hits the road. So <laughs> if you have, you know, bent arms, you're not going to be able to get the help to do what you need to do out of your Pilates routine, right? Yeah. Ah, fantastic. Love that. So cool. All right. So we all, we both agree that reassessment is an ongoing process. Every lesson I'm seeing how they're doing. How are you doing with the stair climbing? How's your shortness of breath? You know, how many syllables can you say per sentence? And how much rest do you need between exercises? What's your intensity level? And um, how are you responding to the exercises? Are you uh, really fatigued the next day? You know, how, how do we need to turn up the volume or turn down the volume? And uh, it's just an ongoing process, but I think it's what makes it so fun. You know, it's not just, I'm just gonna give these 10 exercises every session, do the same ones every time. It's like, I'm gonna change it up. I'm gonna really respond to what the client needs. And that's what makes you a great teacher, I think. Um, and I'm always struggling with, you know, making sure that I'm keeping up with how they're doing and keeping them challenged, keeping at that challenge point. It's a tough job. You know, you're always having to be on it. You can't just, just rest and just kind of teach some exercise. You can if you want to, but it makes it a lot more interesting for you as a teacher and for the client too. Yep. Everybody's a puzzle and we just have to figure it or a mystery and we get to figure out everybody individually all the right. time. Right. And yeah. I just tell my new teachers, um, if you don't really know what's going on, you're never going to go wrong with teaching people how to breathe better. You're yeah. never going to go wrong with teaching people how to stay elongated in their posture, working on their posture and their alignment. Mm -hmm. You're never going to go wrong with that stuff. So if you're not sure what to do, teach them to breathe, <laughs> which is one of our founding principles, right? Yep. So we, I wanted to uh, share some further reading, reading with everybody. Um, I, I'm going to defer to the Wim Hof method. It's like, I've studied this method, but I, but Kathleen helped me know how to say it. <laughs> of course, I was saying Wim Hof at one, one point. Now I'm saying Wim Hof. But anyway, there's this amazing man that is doing some breath work and also cold exposure to increase the immune system. And he has a, a, a wonderful story about losing his wife and being very depressed and debilitated and out of shape. And he wanted to help himself. And so that's what he did is he went on an exploration of, of trying to breathe better and, you know, getting out of a depression and then uh, exposing himself to very cold temperatures. It's pretty, pretty drastic. <laughs> so I'm still working on that part. And then Kathleen turned me on to this book by James Nestor called Breath. And I'm just getting into it because she just turned me on to it last week. So I've ordered it and I've started it, but I'd love to have Kathleen share some of her insights from it. I'm sure a lot of you have read it. I heard about this book from three or four people in the space of about a month. One was my dental hygienist when we were talking about my eldest son's um, sleep difficulties and, um, and whether or not he was a mouth breather or not, which I asked him, I, I actually accused him of being when he was home for Christmas and he <laughs> denied heartedly, <laughs> but she, she really recommended it. So my dental hygienist, then the osteopath that I worked for, who I work for or I work with, I share my office with, that talked about it because my father-in-law was in the hospital with COVID and talking to about being comfortable with raising CO2 levels, which is another interesting part of this book. Um, and then um, two different Pilates teachers. And so it's an easy read. The guy's done a ton of research and um, so much of it you will find is speaking to what we discuss. And he looks back um, at, in historically at what what breathing methods have been um, explored and looking at chants from Buddhist monks, Kundalini yoga, um, uh, breath practice in Japan, Africa, Hawaii, Native American, Buddhist, Taoist, Christian, all of these cultures, in fact, the reading of the rosary, being the breathing practice for a Catholic group, right? They were stunned to find the average number of breaths for each cycle was almost exactly identical. Um, and it was 5.5 breaths per minute, which is a breathe in for a count of just over five and breathe out for a count of five. Where the heck have we heard that before, <laughs> right? It's so fascinating. Um, and then he goes on to talk about again, about um, researchers who've worked with patients with anxiety and depression 
and um, using uh, uh, breath training to treat that. Um, and it just was profound. Like, how did he not stumble across, or maybe it's just that Joseph Pilate studied some of, some of these same breathing practices, but this is exactly what we do in Pilates as well. And it's, um, it's a good read. It's an interesting read. Um, and he, he went underwent, um, an experiment himself where he had to breathe only through his mouth where his nose was plugged I think for two weeks and they monitored a whole bunch of different um, physiological functions and sleep apnea and snoring and fatigue and breath your bad breath all kinds of things which got horrible with mouth breathing and then how quickly they could be restored with appropriate nose breathing so it's a good read i think probably many of you have but check it out if you haven't it's um inspirational yeah. <laughs> no pun intended right exactly exactly can't wait to read the rest of it i'm i'm about halfway through so yeah. looking forward to finishing all right, so we want to tell you about this project called the PACER project. This is the acronym is post acute COVID-19 exercise and rehabilitation project. It was spearheaded by the APTA Academy of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Physical Therapy as a free educational tool with lots and lots of speakers on different topics. There's even blood flow resistance training. Um, or restriction training. And uh, Mary Mastery did a talk and that's where the link at, at the bottom is. Um, I don't know if that link is live for you though, but just go to the PACER project and you can enter Mary Mastery and you will be able to get there. Or you can go to the APTA Academy of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Physical Therapy YouTube channel. And um, there's a lot of different talks on there. And you may not be interested in all of them, but some of them might be helpful because it is focused on exercise. And uh, we wanted to share that with you. And we hope that they will be doing some more updates as, as time goes on. And uh, we'll try to keep you um, uh, notified and um, alerted to any updates that we find out about that would be useful to the Pilates teacher. And you don't have to be an APTA member. You don't even have to be a PT to access those. So it's and they're free. completely open, yeah. And so these, this is Kathleen and I, uh, our contact information, and um, we are just excited to have this discussion and share it with all of you. And we hope that you have a happy, happy 2021 and <laughs> better than 2020. And uh, of course, keep breathing. So thanks for joining us. Yes. Thank you.